that's what we are. We're the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what's over the door as long as Jesus Christ is Lord. That's all that really matters. We've been meeting every Saturday for the past 11 weeks. Last week we had 65 people showed up just to, just to pray for unity. Pastors coming together all over Boone County saying we don't care that we're Methodists. We don't care that we're Baptists. We don't care that we're Pentecostals. We don't care that we're this or that. We just want God to move. Tonight, Richie Schultz will be preaching from the Lick Creek Community Church right here. We are delighted to be able to share in ministry with our other pastors in this area. We're going to break down with the help of God these walls, these barriers. I'm going to be going to some Baptist churches. I'm going to be going to some Methodist churches. They're going to be coming here. We're going to share together one vision of one God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we are asking, asking things. So I want you to put your hands together right now. Welcome Steve Collett and enjoy. Listen to the Word of God. seen the documentary that means I'm your brother whether you like it or not don't you but I'm going to share with you today uh, a story of grace a story of uh, two people that there was no hope for two people that the community the world had uh, given up on two people that had even gave up on themselves and then at the end of this story, you will see that what we had been running from for 40 years was what we should have been running to. But I was raised in Manchester, or uh, Leslie County, Kentucky, the, the, the adjoining county of Clay County. And my dad was a moonshiner, and he was, uh, he was, excess, he was just raised with jealousy. And he would beat my mother till, till she was unrecognizable. And back at that time, there was no such thing as a domestic violence order. And, but Dad would take, take me in the mountains and make me make moonshine. And he would always say, son, if you kill a man, assume it was a squirrel and it would never bother you. And we, we couldn't talk to, I couldn't talk to my dad and I wouldn't talk to my mom because my mom had too much on her plate anyway. And you couldn't talk to your dad. So therefore, you had nothing, nobody to talk to. And I, there's many times as a as a kid, I would just go go off and scream for somebody to come over just to stop my dad from beating my mom. And I knew he was my dad, but I also knew that was my mom. And I couldn't understand why that this man is to beat my mother to death. And but I knew that when I got big enough, when I got old enough, if, if I could live that long and, and all the shooting and all the cutting and all the fighting. That, that I'm going to protect my mom. So when I was 13 years old, I left home. And I didn't know where I was going. I just knew I was leaving. And I'd sleep in old cars. I'd eat where I could eat, and I'd sleep where I could sleep. I'd eat things that make a billy goat cute. You'll do more than you think you will when you have to. And I began to get involved in crowds and begin to make, make buddies. I never did call nobody my friend but my shadow because I never trusted anybody but my shadow. And... Uh, Regardless of what the company was, it was better than being at home because they're not beating my mother. I'm getting beat to death, and I'm a beating people and just fill in the blanks, but it's not my mummy that's getting beat to death. So regardless of the crowd I was in, it, it was okay. It was just okay. It was better than being at home. And as time went on, I began to get in, into street fighting, just, just whatever I had to do to survive. And then I got introduced to drugs. And people that knew me knew, knew that the, the word quit, if, if you're going to get in it, get in it to win it. That's like when I got saved. I said, if I'm going to get in it, get in it to win it. You know, don't ever get in anything to lose it. So if you're a Christian, you're in it to win it. And uh, so people knew that if I got in it, I got in it to win it. And they began to bring, uh, I began to, to test drugs. And I'd always heard this story about how drugs does people. And I'd seen people on drugs and, I thought, yeah, that's about the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of because they ain't nothing that could do me that way, much less 
a little bitty line or something or a little bitty pill. I thought, I, if I ain't heard no guts in that, I'd just forget it. Little did I know, as the drug use got greater, the people became less important in my life. I began doing things that I normally wouldn't do. I began to take from people that I normally wouldn't take from. I began to hurt people that I normally wouldn't hurt. And it got to the point that I realized that I have got, I have got, I have captured a beast here. I have found, I have allowed a beast to come inside me that I just cannot defeat. There is, it became everything I was. My whole identity became in drugs. Whatever I was, whatever that was, drugs had to play part of it. And without it, I was nothing. And I would do anything, whatever it was, or hurt anybody, it didn't matter, to get the next line. And people began then to, to stray from me, but of course that didn't stop it. I ended up getting married. You can only hold a bloom underwater so long when you turn it loose at a surface. You can only hide addiction so long and it will eventually surface. And as the addiction began to surface, my two little girls, I, you know, I'd always tell them I, I'd, I'd never leave you. One cold, snowy evening with about seven inches of snow on the drug lord called, and I left them with nothing in the house, no way of getting anywhere, because I had to go find what satisfied me, regardless of who they was. And that's exactly what I did. I left them crying or begging for daddy, and went back and began to guard drug dealers, and began to, to because if you're guarding a drug dealer, you, you know, you don't have to pay for what you get. And people knew my weakness was I'm in, because if I told you I was in, that meant I would die with you. I, I, and if somebody come to get me to do something, then I, they knew that I would tell them, listen, when I get there, we do it or we die trying to do it. I don't make dry runs. I don't waste your time and you don't waste my time because there's no sense in wasting each other's time. Some people wouldn't go and, some, of course, some people did. But ended up through that, I met my wife, and she was as mean as anybody I'd ever met in my life. And unfortunately, she's sitting right here today with you. And... Uh, so we began running, and we began hurting people. We began stealing from each other's families, and both sides of the family didn't want either one of us around. Uh, we ended up losing our kids. Our kids was miles distance apart from us, never allowed to come over, never allowed to see us. And, of course, at one point in life, we didn't want them around us. And, and, uh, but it got to the point that our families would actually hang a sign up on the door, gone, be back next week. And I'm sitting in the house. And then when you do it time, regardless of how much time you do, when you get out, them good friends that you've got in addiction ask is, Steve, where you been? So you know everybody needs friends like that when they don't even know where you've been. Been gone 10 years, but where have I been? But we always go back because the drug lord calls. And the God of this world is stronger than we are. The God of this world is real. The enemy was here before I was born. He knows exactly every trick. He knows it. I've quit a thousand times. But the enemy always overpowered me. And I was going, I'd go right back into it again. My mother used to pray uh, when I'd get locked up. She'd say, the Lord's answering my prayer. And I'd say, Mom, you think you might ought to quit praying? Because I didn't understand. I didn't understand. Neither did my wife understand. The only thing we understood was we have got to get what satisfies us regardless of the cost. We'll worry about the consequences later, but we're going to get what satisfies us. So we ended up going to jail. And, of course, the state police said there's nothing they'd rather see in my name engraved in a tomb rock. And we'd end up going to jail, and that got us off the street because when the state police and when the law enforcement seen us on the street, they knew somebody was robbed, somebody was hurt, somebody's losing something, that's just the bottom line. They knew that and we knew that. So in our hits, you go to church just to trade drugs. And I didn't want to hear anything uh, that had anything to do about Jesus. I'd heard all this stuff. Jesus died for me. Mary had a little lamb. I knew Christian people uh, drove pretty nice vehicles and their teeth was better than I, what I, mine was. It was meth mouth at the time. And, uh, but, you know, they're not sharing Jesus with me and I, I really don't want to care for him anyway. So this big bald-headed guy came in. Honest, I'll just be honest with you. 
I, he said he was a chaplain. I didn't know what that was. I never heard of a chaplain. But he starts talking about Jesus. So I knew right then, I don't need this. We don't need this. And I would tell him guys in there, I'd say, now when you see that big bald-headed man coming down that hallway there, that little Bible under his arm, I'm going to say, listen, guys, you talk to me, you get, get rid of him. Ain't nobody wants to hear him. He would always come to me. You could go to the bathroom and he'd wait on you. You can't sit on the commode all day, so we've got to see what this man wants. Get him out of here. And when in church one service, he was talking about how big God was. And I said, if this God is so big, why in the world don't he try me? That was the greatest words I've ever said because he tried me. I eat them words and praise God I, for, for saying it. But I got sent off from there with no hope. She, my wife was in prison. We had nothing. We had nobody. None of the drug lords that I gave my life for ever writ would write. Nobody ever sent any money. It was just like in there that you've got to block out this world out here because everything you hear about the outside world is, is bad. So, so I don't want to hear anything bad. I, it's bad enough here. So, so it's, it's almost, in a sense, like your eternity, you're, you're, you're gone. You're, lo you're gone. And uh, no visits, no money. You're just gone. And uh, so you've got to do what you've got to do to survive and learn. And But this big bald-headed guy, every time he would come, he would look me up. And when we would have church, he would always tell me, listen, Steve, I know somebody that can change your life. And my wife would hear of the jail getting shut, the facility getting shut down because of, of course, something I would do. Because I didn't understand. Nobody showed me anything about loving anything. Nobody showed me anything about managing anything. Nobody showed me anything other than try, or hurting somebody and taking what somebody else had. I didn't know anything about what life was about other than what I grew up in. Nobody taught me anything like that. So, but as this big bald-headed guy came, there began to be something different about him. Something is different about this man. There's something different. More, I, listen, my life was watching people because if you don't, you won't survive long in, in the drug world. So I watch people. But there's something different about this man that's telling me about Jesus. But when I got sent off, I knew I'd never see this man again. And the night I got out, the night I served out, when nothing and nobody, no drug lord there that I gave my life for and I've carried, carried the scars for, was there. I got lost in the town and came to a porta potty. The only shelter I had, January 13th, 04, after all the wars that I'd been through in the drug world, after everybody I'd protected and, all, and have died and, and, and was brought back to life, nobody was there. So I, uh, the law enforcement, I didn't want law enforcement to see me walking at night because they hated me and I hated them. So I got in this porta potty and I locked the door and I, I knew it was cold. But I had, I, 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 where do I go? I'm lost. And to keep him from seeing me, I got to stay here because I had pending charges on me in another state and I absolutely was not supposed to be released from the Kentucky Department of Corrections because we had, I had a robbery charge on me in the state of Tennessee that followed me everywhere I went other than that night. So out the vent hose, you could see this apartment complex and this little boy running up and down the stairs and his shoes would light up and I'd never seen anything like that. Everybody had big hooded coats on him. When you breathe, it's like you're smoking a cigar. I was on the run in Harlan County and broke my leg and they put a titanium rod in my leg and if it gets a bit cold, that leg gets numb. I'll never forget that night. I knew that I was going to lose my leg. I, I, this is the night that I freed. This is my last night on planet Earth, but I couldn't think of anything. It was so cold you could fold the tissue and put it between the head and the, and the side of the porta potty. You couldn't put it on the right, but on the, on the front of you, it would numb you through the tissue. And I thought, what in the world could I say for if somebody just right up there in an apartment would let me come and warm up? But I knew that when they seen I just got out that they would freak out. So I sat there. It was about 7 o'clock when I got to the porta potty, it, probably, probably about 7.30. I sat there all night till the next morning. And I remember that this guy was talking about Jesus, and he's also talking about a hell. He's also saying if, if you're not saved when, when you leave this world, you'll go to a burning hell where the worm never dies. 
I'd always heard that. And I knew that this is my last night on planet Earth because I cannot survive in this kind of weather. I cannot stand this cold. So I stood up and I said, God, if there's anything as a God, you know, you know where I'm at. If you won't let me die, I'll serve you. I didn't know you didn't make deals with God. But if you won't let me die, I'll serve you. So I took the tissue and put it around the vents and around the door. And as, as the traffic began to get louder, I knew it was beginning to get morning. And I, 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 when it got daylight, I heard these voices in front of me. And I, I looked out the door and I seen these people go into this business place. The porta potty was there because they were starting a new business place there. So I stepped out and I went in. And that guy said, Man, you just get out. And I said, Yeah. I didn't tell him I just got out of his porta potty. And he said, Well, you can't walk in that kind of weather. So he gave me a big uh, hooded jacket and some gloves. And, and I wasn't cold. And he, I wasn't cold. And they walk back, uh, go back to the back to light the big comb and blowers, and when he did, it would take your breath. And if I ever heard the word of God in my life, it was right then. Say, do you see what I've done? Do you see what I've done? I have protected you through that storm you went through last night inside that world. I knew without a shadow of any doubt that Jesus Christ saved me that night. That when I stood up and said, God, if you won't let me die, he didn't let me die. So now... I go back to my hometown, and you got to realize I don't have a home. I don't have a wife. I, don't, I barely have got me. And the only people that I know is people that's in the drug world because the church didn't want me. Law enforcement didn't want me. The good people didn't want me. So I've got to have shelter. So I begin to stay with this meth dealer. And all of us, one evening, and, and I knew God has saved me now, but but this, but this I had to have shelter. So uh, one evening, this pickup pulls up in front of this meth dealer, and it's that big ball-headed guy from the place that I. And he said, "Steve, I want you to go to church with me." So I went to church with him, and because I knew God saved me, I knew I had to start trying to get along with Christian people, and I didn't know how that was going to work. So I went to church with him, and he said about halfway up in the pew in the seats and instead of the back where I could just slip out. And here these people was, and they was just, I was looking for them to do something so I could leave. I've been there seven years and ain't done nothing, so I ain't left. And, uh, but as I began to go to that church, I began to see something different that I'd never seen in people. That church accepted me. And I told my wife, and, uh, and she said, well, that don't mean I'll go to that church. So I'm going back to my home county now, staying with these meth dealers, and this, this drug world is beginning to pile right back on me because they wanted me back. And I, this, this guy calls one day, and he said, I said, man, I can't make it. I can't make it. I cannot make it. I said, I can't. I'd rather be in prison than have this pressure on me. And he said, we've got to get you to Manchester. So I moved to Manchester, Kentucky, in a little old apartment there with garbage piled up and an old, rat, an old mattress there, and these rats big as beaver. But it was my home. And every day, this guy, he would come and get me, and we would go start, we'd start telling people about Jesus. And I'd go to church, and these people was just people. And I was looking for them to make me mad any time so I can leave this place. But they never did change. But all of a sudden, church, the very thing that had destroyed me every, uh, and everything in my life, the very thing that, that the beast that had destroyed me methamphetamine all of a sudden I just realized one day in church I don't want it anymore I just realized that Jesus Christ not only had he saved me but he had defeated that beast that had put me through a living Hades all my life he reminded me that he set me free whom the son says free is free indeed he reminded me Steve you don't want meth anymore you don't want cocaine anymore and I could not believe it. And I wanted to start telling people about Jesus. I wanted to start telling drug dealers and drug addicts about the man that had set me free. And, and people was blowed out of their mind. Some people gave me six months and after that they gave me extension. It's been seven years and they don't know what to think. Some people has even come and said, Steve, is that you, man, that's doing that lifeline group up here? I said, yes, it is. Jesus will do that for you. We just had to see if that was really you. I thought people had lost their mind. No, I said, I just lost my mind for 40 years, but I could Jesus give it back to me. 
So that's what I do today. So my wife gets out of prison and she comes and she got saved in prison, but, but she, we begin to go to that church. And she, begin, she loves that church because that church has accepted us. And see, you got to understand one time in, in the year 2000 that we served out at the same time and tried to go to church, but the church really didn't want to send it. So we went back to cocaine. But this church accepts us. And not only did that, that Jesus Christ set me free from the thing that had, had tore our families apart for years of our life. We didn't even know what love meant because our God was drugs. Not only did Jesus set us free, Jesus gave us a home. Jesus gave us the land we live on today. We own the sand that we live on today in Manchester, Kentucky. Our families is restored. They took the sign down that said, be back next week. They took the sign down. My little girls that I had walked off from in a seven-inch snow now hollers, Daddy, Daddy. The son of my wife now hollers, Mommy. The, the children, and then when they come over, they spend more time with her, of course, than they do me. And God has just absolutely, not only did he save us, but he has gave us life. And now we're the Lifeline Ministers in Manchester, Kentucky. I speak to the schools to tell them to steer them from drug addiction. Listen, I'm not the answer, but I can give them, I know who the answer is. I know, what, I know who the answer is. And the people that's in addiction, the people that's struggling in life, the people that's just barely hanging on to the next line and they're looking for the next one as they're hanging on to it. I can tell them something. Jesus Christ will take that craving. He will take that straw from your mouth and replace it with a Bible. You cannot, you cannot defeat, you cannot defeat the, the beast of drug addiction. You cannot defeat methamphetamine, you are not strong as the God of this world. You have got to have something in you stronger than the God of this world because guess what? You cannot defeat the devil. And the devil was here before we was born. And I, I tell you today, church, because I see what you guys are doing and I'm excited about what you guys are doing. I'm just, I just love your pastor here. He's got, the, he's got the heart of a lion and a lion dies without fear just like you guys. You guys are pouring your heart out to the people. But you know, church, there's some people right here today that was just like me and Leslie. Honey, stand up here a minute. Just like me and my wife here. There's some people here today that the uh, community sees no hope in, just like we was. Just like we was. There's some people here today. Go ahead. There's some people here today that is struggling and with life. They're struggling in their marriage. They have taken from their children, just like we did. They have stole from their husbands and their wife, just like we did. And they've almost run till they can't run any farther, just like we did. And you've done this a thousand times, but it never gets any better. Seem like it keeps getting worse. It just keeps getting worse. Although you've heard of Jesus, although you know that Jesus Christ, when you didn't know how you woke up, when you woke up that time when you got to that place you was at, He took the wheel. He took the wheel. He kept you from hitting a tractor trailer head on and killing a or killing a whole family children when your heart was almost stopped from all the drugs that you had put in your body when the devil thought that he had you you know what I'm talking about Jesus said no I've got a plan for her life I've got a plan for his life and at the same time you know more than one person that it's not as fortunate as you are today, that they'll never be inside this church because their eternity started for the very same thing you're doing. Their eternity started. They are, they're not here today. They're in eternity. But you are. But you are. The grace of God on you 
you're here. His mercy. He didn't let your heart stop. He didn't let you, he didn't keep you from, he let you keep breathing. Because he has a plan for you. But you have run. You have stoled. You have hurt. You ain't trusted anybody, not even yourself. I know how that is. You just trust your shadow. But you're about to run out of time. Jesus speaks once. He says, I speak once, I speak twice. Have you not heard, Herod, has it not been taught, spoken to you from the beginning? You've heard Jesus died for you and Murray had a little lamb. But you didn't ever get to know the Savior. If I want, let me see a show of hands right here, right now, that if you knew that you was going to leave this earth today, you would go to heaven. How many knows that they would go to heaven? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones that didn't hold their hand up. That's who I'm talking to. You are one heartbeat. And I'm not trying to scare you. Listen, man, I'm just seven years old. All, only, all the sense I've got is the sense enough to tell the truth that God's gave me. But you're one heartbeat from the gates of hell. God has kept you here. He has pulled you through the storms. He has protected you when you didn't even know it. And He's uh, screaming at you today because our time here is short on this earth. If you live to be a thousand years old, it's, got nothing, it's nothing like eternity. It's nothing like eternity. And you're going to make a choice that's going to determine your everlasting destiny today. Because I'm going to ask you, because I know that this God's not an accident God, that he's got you here today for a reason because you, th this was your appointment today. God knew you was going to be here. He knew I was going to ask you. He knew I was gonna, you was going to hear me. Last week, last month, last year, but you didn't know it and I didn't either. We're running out of time. Your heart is still clicking. But I'm going to ask you, if you're sick of running, if you're sick of being sick, if you're sick of searching, I know how it is. I know how it is. I know how it is to always have to know where that next line is. Regardless of your wife, it don't matter. She'll be okay. She'll be okay. I've got to make sure I've got enough gas to get there, but I'll run, I don't care if I run out if I come back. I've got to make sure that I've got to... I ain't no use to pay this electric bill. No, the electric bill don't matter. Oh, them kids will be okay. They don't need school clothes. They'll be all right. Let them wear what they wore last year. The church will give them something. I know how that is. I know how it is. I know how it is to wake up in a living hell every day of, my, of your life. Because I know how it is to be lost. I know how it is to be lost. I know how it is to have no hope. But let me tell you something. I know how it is to be saved. I know how it, I know how it is to wake up in freedom. I know the one that can set you free. And I'm going to offer him to you. And you're going to either take it or you're going to leave it. So if you have run long enough, then I ask you to come up here and let us pray with you. And if you brought somebody with you today, church, tell them, say, if you'll go, I'll go with you. Because this is a matter of life and death. Right now, if you're tired of running, if you're tired of running, if you're tired of hurting, and Jesus is calling you, come up here and let us pray with you right now. As he sings this song, let us pray with you. Right now. Hallelujah. Right now, listen, this is about you. I'm going back to Manchester. I'm going back to Manchester, but you're either going to take Jesus out or you're going to take the devil back out of here with you. 
and I'm going to make sure that I don't send the devil with you because I'm giving you a choice. I give myself I'm, I'm you make the choice, away my friend. so Are you, you hurt? can use me. Are you tired of hurting? Give myself away. Jesus wants to set you free, but do you want to be free? Give myself Do you want to be free today? So you Listen. Can you use me? There are a lot of company for you in hell. But there are a lot of life for you in heaven. But what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? You cannot defeat the God of this world. He's bigger than you are. He'll just keep hurting you, pushing you, and pushing you and saying, wait, just wait, just wait, because He knows if you wait long enough, He's got you. He's got you. And then your whole life was a waste. Your whole life was just a waste. This altar's waiting on you. Jesus is hollering at you. This ain't about me, my friend. But I love you so much that I want to see you set free. But do you want to be set free? Do you want to be free? Let me pray with you right here, right now. If you'll come. If you'll come. Hallelujah. Give myself away so you can use me. Jesus is waiting. The devil's keeping you right there where you're at because that's what he's good at doing. Give myself he's put you through hell. And he wants to put you through some more. Can you me with my Jesus is waiting. Father, just bring your honor and glory. God. Give myself your honor and glory, Father God. We just ask you, Father, to pour out your spirit here today, God. Pour out your spirit here, God. God, don't let them go back out of this place the way they came in. Father, we know the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, you said that I have come that they may have life and may have life more abundant. Hallelujah. God, you have a life for my brothers out here. God, Holy Spirit, draw them. And as I said, if you brought somebody, say, I'll go with you. You want to go, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. This choice, this choice that God is trying to get you to make, the devil's trying to keep you right there in your seat because he knows how to play you. He's played you the biggest part of your life. Let me ask you something. How do you like his game? How do you like how he's done you? Give myself away so you can use me. Give myself Yes, I do. You know something? If I could give you the ingredients that would cure cancer, if I told you to write it down, uh, you'd write it down and you'd go to Rite Aid and you'd feel it. And then you'd cure cancer for everybody. But I'm telling you somebody that's going to give you an eternal life that would keep you out of the gates of hell. Well, the worm dies not. And you're going to yes. sit there and let the devil win again. Yes, 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 yes. I have got the remedy, the antidote for eternal, eternal life. His name's Jesus. 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 The one that took 39 stripes. The one that was beat to a corpse for you. That took 39 stripes across his back. And that was the crown of thorns mashed in his head and was nailed to the cross. You know something? If the community looked down at you and said, I don't put much of a value on their life. Do you know what Jesus says when he looks down and he puts a price on you? God said, you're worth my son. He said, you're worth his son. And it's free. I can't set you free, but I know who can set you free. I can't give you everlasting life, but I know who can. I know who can.
40 years of hell and seven years of heaven. Listen, if I lost anything back there, I'm not going back to get it. I'm not going back to get it. If Jesus is calling you, we get ready to... Jesus is calling you. Let us pray with you. You've got to realize something. This is about what you're taking back to the house. This is about your heart beating and a beating and a beating and it's still going to stop someday, my friend. Yeah, we are all going to face eternity. We're, there's two people serious about your life. One of them's name is Satan. The other's name is Jesus. The other's name is Jesus. Listen, he's God. He don't need me, but I need him. I need him. He's not going to make us do it because he loves us. He's going to let us make the choice which way we go. <clears throat> so you make that choice. You say, look, man, you don't understand what I'm going through. No, I don't, but I know who does. You say, you don't understand what I'm taking today. No, I don't understand what you're taking, but I understand what it is. But I know who does. I know who knows that the next line that you find, he already knows it. He already knows you're going to mess up if you come to him because you're not perfect. Listen, Jesus was perfect and they, but most, they didn't listen to him. What about your life? Before I go back to Manchester, Kentucky, I want to pray with you. Listen, I care that much. I care that much. But how much do you want change? How much do you want life? How much? I know how it is to sit in the church and grip the seat. Take your fingers, it's numb. 
And I also know how it is to leave a place like this and want to smack yourself because you didn't go. Because you let the enemy win again. What about you? Don't you think that, don't you think you've given the enemy enough of your life? Ain't he put you through enough hell? Ain't you tired? You know how it feels to be free? Do you know how it feels to be free? Instead of laying there wondering where with a 357 cocked in your mouth? What about you? Some of them has made that decision. The greatest decision they've ever made in their life. They made it today. But what about you? What about you? Listen, I made mine. It may have been in a porta potty, but I made it. If you can get saved in there, it's most likely you get saved anywhere. He wants you just as you are. Just like you are. You can keep everything you want to keep. He just wants your heart. If the looks got us into heaven, I'd be drove up. But he wants your heart, praise the Lord. He wants your heart. But what do you want for the rest of your life? Notice what I said. The rest of of your life I'm going to go ahead and tell you you can close your eyes and put your date of birth day and year you was born on a tomb rock but you can't put the date of death but the devil knows the date of death that's why he keeps saying wait just wait do you know some people that can't wait any longer do you know some people that their eternity has started? That waited? That waited. Did you know if we go to hell, we send ourselves there? Jesus came for you to have life and have life more abundant. Hallelujah. Before we close, if you want me to pray with you, let us do it. This ain't about me. This is about you. This is about Jesus taking you and using you like he's used me and my wife. But how bad do you want it? You're going to take the one you love the most back out the door. Whoever you love the most, you're going to take back out that door. Father, I just pray, God, for if there's anybody else here today, God, as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, cheer, God. Father, I just pray, Father, to convict their heart, God, and God, just bring them to you. Allow them to know, God, regardless of what, how, where they've been, what they've done, or how they've done it. God, that, that you want to save them, God, and you want to use them. Father, you want to help them. God, you want to help them if they're in addiction. God, you want to help them if they're, whatever it is, God, you want to allow, you want to help them, Lord. So, Father, we praise you today, and I thank you today, God, and I thank you for the brothers and the sisters here, Father. And, God, we just ask you now, if there's anybody else, if there's anybody else, if, if you're a Christian church, just pray. If there's anybody else here, let us pray with you. And thank you all for allowing me to be. Hallelujah. We're going to transition into water baptism. I can have some men to uncover the baptistry, get that ready. If you are a candidate for water baptism, and you need to change, you can slip out right now. We're going to quickly transition into our water baptism service. Please don't leave. This is important. Stephanie, where are you, Stephanie? Just gave her heart to the Lord. She wants to be baptized. She needs some clothes. If you've got some clothes in the car, 
if you've got something she can wrap in and go home dry, we don't, we already got it taken care of. All right. Praise God. Praise God. Enjoy the music. Perhaps we'll be singing some hymns. I don't know. But we're going to enjoy the blessings of the Lord in this place. 